Welcome back to The George Show. Today, we are meeting Richard Garriott once again. Richard Garriott is the man behind Ultima and Ultima Online. He's starting a new company called Portalarium. And today, we focus on Richard in space, his trip to the space station. Richard, say hi. Hi again. Welcome back again, or thank you for having me back again, I should say. <laughs> Guys, if you want to see the previous episodes, there's a link above the video as well as in the description below. In part one, we talked about Ultimate Collector, Richard's new game on Facebook. In part two, we talked about Ultimate RPG, Richard's new up and coming game, which is the spiritual successor to Ultima and Ultima Online. And today we talk about Richard in space. Richard, please share with us, for the few who don't know, <laughs> what happened? How come you went into space? Yeah, you know, it's funny, uh, uh, when people hear about my kind of dual careers or activities in computer games in space, they some, some people go like, you know, what? what? How are these things related? And uh, and I look at them as extraordinarily related. Um, yeah, first of all, uh, just in a general sense, I, I'm a big believer that, um, you know, my passion for creating and living and in and exploring virtual worlds is highly intercoupled with my personal passions for exploring the reality in which we live. Right. Uh, everything from the physical surface of the earth to the deep oceans to, frankly, history and books, uh, uh, as well as, of course, uh, you know, outer space. And, uh, but space in particular, not only is it a, you know, a pinnacle exploration to go on for anyone, uh, but I happen to have a, a personal history with it that, that uh, predates gaming uh, fairly significantly. Mm. Uh, uh, in particular, my father was a NASA astronaut starting uh, when I was six years old. Uh, he became uh, an employee of NASA, and we lived right outside the front gates of NASA. Uh, my, my father flew twice to space, first in 1974 aboard Skylab, and then in 84 on the space shuttle. Uh, and so I grew up, uh, you know, not only with that as my, you know, father figure home inspiration but literally both my left and right hand neighbors were also astronauts wow. and in the blocks surrounding my home were almost all the other Apollo era astronauts and their families and children so I just grew up believing everybody goes to space because everybody <laughs> in my neighborhood did go to space and so um, uh, for me it was a big shock when at the age of about 13 I was told that because I wore glasses I was no longer eligible to be a NASA astronaut uh... and well, before that, I would have never said when I grew up on being an astronaut. Starting at that day, I said, well, you know, who is that doctor to be the gatekeeper to space? I'm going to invent civilian space flight and uh, therefore take myself to space. And at the age of 13, that didn't sound that hard. Uh, of course, it was very hard. Uh, many failed attempts along the way. Uh, but and then eventually, uh, we I got together with a group of entrepreneurs. We started something called the X Prize, uh, Zero G Corp, Space Adventures. Uh, and with Space Adventures, we finally uh, convinced the Russians to fly uh, private citizens into space. And ultimately, that's how I made my trip. And so in uh, October of 2008, I became the 483rd person to leave the Earth uh, when I went uh, launched aboard a Russian Soyuz rocket and uh, uh, lived aboard the International Space Station for two weeks. Would you? Uh, how many other people? Were there any other commercial, uh, pr like tourists, going into space before you? So my company arranged uh, for there. There have been seven private citizens who have flown to space. Uh, my company sent all seven uh, of my company's clients. I was client number five, and uh, uh, excuse me, not client number six, because uh, Charles Simone went twice, once before me and once after me. <laughs> he went twice. Uh, he couldn't twice. get enough the first time. Wow. Exactly. <laughs> But uh, but I was actually scheduled to be the number the first client. I, I mean, I built this company so I right. could go. You get, and, yeah. uh, uh, but sadly, the first ticket that we had arranged, which was originally going to be my flight, uh, is also right as the 2001 stock market crash occurred. And so uh, with that crash disappeared my uh, personal wealth. And so I, I had to see. sell that seat to a guy named Dennis Tito, who became the first private citizen to fly himself into space. And I had to go build another company, sell another company, and then finally went in 2008. You had to go back and work to earn the revenue money to go back into space. That's, that's, that's amazing. Well, you know, what's, what's funny too, you think about it now, you go like, it's, it's funny, I have, um, uh, you know, people, you know, I've been in this industry, uh, the computer game industry for 30 years, and people go like, you know, you know why are you still doing it? Right. And I'm going like, well, really, on the one hand, I am still exceptionally passionate about games. I mean, there's no way I'd be doing it if I wasn't truly impassioned right. about games, and I really am now a bigger gamer than I ever been in any other previous time in my life. Uh, 
However, also, I still have this passion for space, and space is not cheap. And so I really, I feel, I feel the need to work also, just because I have all kinds of fun things I want to do in space still. For example, um, uh, one of the capabilities that's coming online right now too is suborbital space vehicles. Uh, and uh, with this other organization I mentioned called the X Prize, uh, with the X Prize, we uh, put together a ten million dollar prize for the first private company to uh, fly a vehicle twice into space in two weeks, oh. hoping to open up a new industry of suborbital vehicles. Uh, that prize was won in 2004. Uh, Virgin Galactic is now buying those, those vehicles, and those will hopefully be flying in about a year. But there are wow. some others flying, like my favorite is being built, built by another uh, computer game guy, uh, John Carmack, the guy that wrote Doom and uh, Quake. Uh, he's building a vertical takeoff, vertical landing rocket uh, that is not only, I think, uh, one of the price performance winners in the long run, but it also means that when it's at its highest point, it's basically hovering in the air at any altitude you wish, and you can jump out. Oh. Which means, which means you could skydive from 10,000 feet, skydive with oxygen at 25,000 feet, skydive with a pressure suit, say at above 50,000 feet, or you can wear a spacesuit and break records at 100,000 feet, or go all the way up to 50 to 100 kilometers and do true space dives. And so that's uh, one of the things that I'm hoping to do. Uh, and so, uh, well, I've got to earn a little money and invest in some rockets and spacesuits. That's amazing. I mean, we go from bungee jumping. <laughs> <laughs> to skydiving, to space diving, that's that's that's. I mean, that's the logical progression, I guess. Absolutely. What about the space elevator? Is there any hope in material built strong enough to create a a line that anchors from the space station to the ground, and you just take an elevator up? Well, interestingly, uh, you know, there's good news and bad news on that on that front. Uh, you know, the good news is that uh, that the, a material such as you described actually technically exists. You know, carbon fiber nanotubes um, are strong enough to where if you built a cable of sufficient diameter and a sufficient length, it would work. The problem is, is that uh, the largest piece of carbon uh, carbon fiber nanotube that's ever been made is, you know, effectively microscopic. Mm. And worse yet, even if you could build it at, I don't even know what the diameter would be, but if you could build it at the diameter that would be required, the length that we're talking about to go to a geosynchronous satellite is so long that just the mass of it would be, you know, I don't even know exactly what the multiple would be, but I'll, I'll estimate it, you know, 1,000 or 10,000 times more mass than has ever been launched into space in the history of humanity. Right. Beyond that, if it were to ever fail during the deployment, it would wrap around the Earth many, many times, destroying everything that it uh, encountered uh, along its uh, collapse. Uh, and so the probability of it happening anytime soon is, uh, you know, it, it's so far into the future, if ever, that it's, it's not worth uh, holding your breath for. Right. Uh, but mathematically, most things that, that, most, most things that are provably mathematically provable mathematically eventually come to pass uh, but no time soon in this case so the same thing is true for like uh, you know wormholes you know mathematically they theoretically exist uh, but you know to keep one open for a fraction of a second requires the energy of the destruction of a star and so uh, you know it's just not gonna you know those are just not likely uh, anytime soon science fiction for now for now so a little bit more about the personal experience of you going into space. Uh, can you give uh, the viewers a little taste of the training that was required for you before you could go into space, as well as the actual flight from the moment the rocket engines fired off and you were you were moving? Yeah, you know it's um, it's really amazing that uh, the training aspects, which you might think would be work, um, were really a, an ama were amazing unto themselves. Uh, I spent about a year in Russia, about three weeks out of every month in Russia for a year training uh, because uh, on the Soyuz and on the space station, there's really no um, uh, you know, tourist seat or uh, places you can uh, hang out. Uh, you know, when you're on the Russian Soyuz, there is work, there's controls in front of you that you must operate or the, the flight does not succeed. I and see. so, uh, uh, so there's things you, you must master. In addition, uh, just from a safety standpoint, you really want every person on board the ship to be able to at least operate every piece of equipment without 
hurting it or damaging it or interfering with what other people are doing right. or having to ask other people how to use it, which would take them away from their activities. Right. And similarly on board the space station, it's really important, you know, basically what everything does and especially all the emergency equipment and procedures, you really need to know them all uh, because, again, you don't want to be a danger uh, to everyone else uh, on board. Uh, so I really enjoyed the training. The training was phenomenal. But what I also found was interesting about it is what it was not. For example, you know, I went to Russia uh, for about a year before I went. And when I knew I was going, you know, I, I, I trained physically very hard. I was in the best shape I'd been in, you know, since high school when I arrived in Russia to start my training. Mm -hmm. To discover that I was now actually in much better physical condition than every other astronaut or cosmonaut who was over there training. Really? And so, uh, uh, because, yeah, because the, the physical demands really just aren't anywhere near what I expected them to be. Oh. And, and, and similarly, you know, you think of rocket scientists or, you know, these, these uh, you know, astronauts. And, you know, astronauts, of course, are smart people. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty smart guy, too. And, uh, and what I found when I got over there was that the training was much more familiar and pleasant than difficult as I might have expected. For example, mm. if you are a scuba diver, everyone who goes and gets a scuba license has to learn about partial pressures of gases and how not to get the bends when the pressure goes from high pressure at depth to low pressure at, uh, near the surface. Right. And those same conditions are the case for being in space. I mean, the, you might have a depressurization of the, of the vehicle and you have to manage the gas mixtures of oxygen and carbon dioxide and things on, in, on board. And you're going like, okay, well, that's the training for that. So life support's like scuba diving. Well, then there's all the radio communication gear. Well, if you can get a ham radio license where you learn just basic simple stuff like how to turn it on and the relationship between frequency and wavelength, which, you know, isn't that complicated. It's, it's high school physics, right. uh, but anybody in high school can go get a ham radio license. Well, now you can know how to operate all the radios on board the Soyuz spacecraft and on the International Space Station, hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so what you'll find is that none of, no one subject was, uh, you know, what I'll call scary or out of line with things that uh, uh, any, anyone who's mastered any of the the fields I just said would 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 uh, be intimidated by. Uh, the, the most intimidating actually was uh, language, uh, because uh, on the Russian Soyuz, all the manuals, all the documents are only in Russian. All the instruments are labeled only in Russian. All the commands that come up from Mission Control are all in Russian. And so uh, the hardest thing by far was learning a new language, which uh, you know I don't know well, but сейчас я знаю русский язык чуть-чуть, a little bit. And so, uh, you know, I had to learn uh, at least the basics. I but, see. Uh, but by the time training ended, I actually was, uh, would describe to people that I was, uh, you know, very content that if the world ended today and we never got to fly, I still felt my time and money were, were pretty well spent. Um, but, of course, nothing beats the flight. Right. The, uh, uh, but what's cool about the flight is, again, where it differs from what you might think. You know, when you think of a rocket taking off, uh, you know, it, it's on the outside, it's loud, it's bright, there's lots of buffeting and vibration that you can feel even just standing, you know, a mile away from the, the launch of a rocket. But on the inside, it's completely different. On the inside of any rocket that has liquid fuel, which means anything other than the solid rocket boosters on the shuttle, any liquid-fueled rocket, as the, as the engines throttle up, you, you eventually cross the point where the thrust is slightly greater than the mass of the rocket. And once the throttle up goes past that point, the rocket barely imperceptibly begins to move up off the launch pad. And so it's not like dropping the clutch on a sports car and off you go. It really <laughs> is like very, it's like an ele elegant ballet move that lifts you ever faster into the sky. I oh. mean, it's, it's extremely serene. It's almost perfectly quiet. It's almost perfectly smooth. It, uh, you just rise faster and faster into the sky and the G-forces slowly push you gently into your seat. Uh, and, it's, and, and the whole ride, you burn all of the mass of the rocket, or 98% of the mass of the rocket, which is all fuel, you burn it in eight and a half minutes. So in eight and a half minutes, you go from sitting still on the ground to the engines cut off and you're now free floating in space. It's a really phenomenal. It's less than 10 minutes to get into space. Yeah, yeah, very quick. It's, wow. over, it's over before you know it. <laughs> and uh, uh, and the reentry is sort of the same way. Uh, reentry, you know, you, you hit the Earth's atmosphere going 17,000 miles an hour. That's so fast that just the friction on the molecules of the upper atmosphere that you strike, you know, literally tear molecules apart 
and create a plasma that is hotter than the surface of the sun. And so I was sitting by uh, the right-hand window, so my shoulder was literally touching the inner pane of glass. The, the glass is multiple panes, or the window is multiple panes, it's maybe three inches thick. And on the other end of that three-inch stack of, mater of clear materials, whatever they're, I'm not even sure what they're all made out of, it is literally hotter than the surface of the sun. And, and so it's just shocking to look out the window and go like, look, you know, this, this far away from my skin, it is hotter than the surface of the sun, and yet I feel none of the heat at all. And, uh, uh, and even though you've now encountered the atmosphere, uh, the upper atmosphere is very thin, of course, so you don't even feel any resistance. You don't feel any G-forces at all until you begin to go deeper and deeper and deeper into the atmosphere and slowly again you sink into your seat as the G-forces pick up, as the atmosphere thickens, as the breaking you know, increases. Uh, and, uh, and then eventually, only when you're, you know, relatively speaking, pretty close to the ground, do you pop parachutes and then land on the ground. And so, mm -hmm. uh, again, it's a much more cerebral, pleasant experience than uh, movies would you know, lead you to believe. So there's none of this shaking and dangerous... No. Things going in fact, on. <laughs> the, big, the biggest shake came when the parachutes opened. Because then it's like, a, you know, then it's like, you know, you, the parachute unfurls and then it gives you a good yank. And right. so, yeah, there's a big yank, but that's the parachute. You know, it's not, it has nothing to do with re entering the atmosphere. Wow. That's, I mean, as you said, that sounds very pleasant. It's just a. And you know, and technically, those are the those are the dangerous times. You know, you, every accident there has been associated with spaceflight has occurred during one or the other of these two moments. Right. Uh, but uh, but you know, you you don't you're well past that. I mean, you're not gonna you know you know you're you're resigned to whatever's going to occur, and and there's nothing about either launch or reentry that is scary. If you know what I mean. Right. I mean, if it was shaking violently, you know, you might think that'd be pretty scary, but in fact, it's very elegant in both directions so uh, very unscary as you said it, it's, it's like ballet that's that's a yeah. very good analogy yeah so and which, then, go ahead I was gonna say and then of course there's the middle section which is the chance to uh, float in space and you know spend two weeks you know 24 hours a day floating around like Superman Right. And, uh, you know, uh, there's a gazillion stories I could tell you in here, but, uh, but, 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 but probably the most important to get out up front is, is really what the, what the most impactful part of spaceflight is, is not the joy of being there, which is a pretty darn good joy. Uh, it's really looking back at the Earth. It's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, which every astronaut, including my dad, you know, told me that that's the part you're going to, you know, want to do the most and remember the most. And they are all uh, completely right. That uh, you know, looking out the window at the Earth, it's like a fire hose of information about the truth of the reality in which we live, just pouring into your mind as you just look at the world roll by at 17,000 miles an hour from a vantage point about 250 miles up, and uh, uh, just phenomenal, uh, life-changing uh, view. Wow! Wait, when you said 17,000 miles per hour, that's to maintain a geosynchronous or orbit? No, no, that's to maintain orbit at all. Oh, uh, not geosynchronous. Geosynchronous is much higher. Much you know higher. what's what's interesting about it, if you know if you had uh, you know a, a classic children's globe you know a one foot diameter children's globe right. uh, the space station and anything in low Earth orbit is only about the width of a nickel above the surface of the Earth. I see. Very close. You have to be in a very perfect circular orbit, or you you know, you'll skip on the atmosphere if you're not careful. Uh, but geosynchronous orbit, where for example uh, satellites are for television, if you if you think of this as the diameter of the Earth. You know, there are many, 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 you know, down here at the end of my arm's length, uh, you know, is how far away geosynchronous satellites are uh, so that they go around at the same speed as one day of rotation of the Earth. Very far away, technically moving much faster, right. uh, but holding a static position in the sky. Right, that makes sense. Okay. Now, then share with us, a, I know you said you have a gazillion stories, but if you could pick one or two that you feel would be really in interesting for the viewers uh, to experience vicariously through your description of the event, um, how was the two weeks in the space station? Well, you know, so what's interesting is uh, uh, while most everything was joyful, uh, it's probably worth mentioning, uh, you know, what I'll call the, the bit of suffering that most people <laughs> do also in space. Um, which is, you know, and I mentioned uh, two parts. You know, one is uh, space adaptation, which often uh, uh, hurts people's first few days in orbit. Uh, about 80% of the people get effectively motion sickness, you know, vomiting style motion sickness. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I did not get that one. Okay. Um, but I did get the other version, which is called fluid shift, 
where if you imagine if you were to lie with your head down on a steep slide, you know, you could lie on a children's slide at a park with your head down for a few minutes and you wouldn't notice or care. But if you stayed there for a few hours, you know, you'd begin to feel kind of bloated in your face because right, of the blood, the blood. pooling in your, in, in your head. And that's sort of the way you feel when you're in space, sort of the way I, I, I did feel this way in space. And so it gives you a bit of a headache and stuffy nose and, hmm. uh, you know, so it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, particularly pleasant for uh, two or three days of what I'll call headaches and head cold. Uh, but th that eventually goes away and you get back to the joy part. The other, the other kind of funny thing to point out about the, the, the other trial and tribulation of, uh, of space flight is the bathroom. <laughs> because uh, a zero-G toilet uh, is, uh, is, if I was going to redesign one thing on the space station or with space vehicles, it would be the bathroom. Uh, <laughs> and and, it's, and it's, uh, it's interesting because gravity is a particularly useful thing when it comes from taking the things that come out of your body into a receptacle uh, to dispose of them. And so with, without gravity, they try to use things like airflow, you know, basically a vacuum cleaner to kind of pull solids out of the air nearby into a container. But they frankly don't work that well. And so, uh, and so going to the bathroom space is a, is a true trial that takes you, uh, you know, tens of minutes to uh, power up, utilize, and then safe afterwards the uh, space toilet. I mean, it's the most common thing you wouldn't even think about, but you're absolutely right. That is a very important aspect of humanity, which is removing waste. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but, but then to flip, let me give you one more story, uh, uh, you know, on what I'll call the positive side. One of the, one of the okay. kind of interesting um, aspects of, of this, which is since, since there's no gravity that you feel, um, you, there's no real, you don't really care which surface you think of as the floor or the ceiling right. you know you're very you're very happy to reorient yourself as needed and in fact it's very common that one person will be sitting on what we might call the floor you know towards the earth uh doing an experiment and if you need to be in the same room to do an experiment you'll often just go sit on what you might call the ceiling and uh and that way you don't bump heads or take up you know the same floor space because there's right. air all around you and you don't really notice or care um but there's so the interesting side effect of that is, is that you know, as you learn to fly through these spaces, you know, you quickly just cling onto whatever surface you think of as the as the floor for that moment. Right. But it's an interesting mental game you can play with yourself. So what I thought was interesting is that uh, there was a junction in the space station where uh, there was a, a U.S. module that had a T intersection to a Japanese module and a European module. So um, basically a, a large T intersection of school buses. So imagine, you know, school buses with a junction between them, uh, all open to each other. And what I found was fascinating is if you floated in this intersection, and I might, for example, float with my legs facing into one module, my back towards the earth, and my head towards another module, uh, and you would float there. And since I, when you move your body into that position, you have a sense of which direction is the Earth. So in your mind, you initially almost always think of that as down. Down, right. I'm, I'm floating with my back down. But then you close your eyes, and you just think to yourself, my feet are now in the direction of down. And when you open your eyes, you suddenly you see your feet over this deep hole below you into that module that you're suspended towards. And you suddenly get this rush of vertigo because you feel like you're about to fall into oh. this chasm which right. of course you don't. But then you can do the same thing. You can close your eyes again and you can say, now I am head down. And you open up your head and you look behind you another module and you think, now I'm diving into a deep module behind me. And so there's these fascinating, um, you know, physics and reality, uh, you know, uh, things you can change, uh, you know, as you just uh, decide to in your mind. That's fascinating because I imagine uh, going underwater would be a similar environment because you have no concept of up down um, and uh, you, you might experience the same vertigo. Um, in a video game, I remember I think I jumped off like a big cliff in uh, Skyrim and I felt vertigo because I was right. like going face first into <laughs> a very unpleasant uh, uh, demise. Um, but in space, I, I actually can't imagine, I mean, I, I can imagine, but from what you describe, um, you're almost telling your mind, reality is this, and then you believe it when you open your eyes. It's yep. like you can convince yourself of, of, of anything. Um, 
fascinating. Because again, there's because there's nothing to disagree with it. You know, right. so here's what's interesting. So by the way, scuba diving or even holding your breath and doing tumbling in a pool is actually very similar to floating in space. I see. But if you but if you stand on your head in a pool, you can still sort of feel the fluids go to one end of your body and the air in your lungs kind of go toward the other extreme. Right. So you can still sort of get a sense of up and down, not as well as you can out standing in the air or standing upright, but a little sense. But in space, it's that sense is gone entirely. entirely. And so that's, uh, that's, I think, why it's so easy for your brain to override it is because there's no inputs that your brain has to, to fight it. Uh, on the other hand, you know, this, this uh, motion sickness that a lot of people get, or this, uh, something like motion sickness a lot of people get, imagine the following. You know, uh, with you and I, you know, right here, we're feeling gravity that you, you have a vestibular function of your inner ear that tells us this way is down. Down, right. Uh, well, in space, of course, that doesn't happen. Uh, in space, if I move my head forward, the fluid in your inner ear sloshes to the back, and it makes you feel like you're falling. Oh. If you, okay, you get it? And, uh, Interesting. Uh, and so in, in, when you first arrive in space, what your inner ear is programmed to be is a gravity detector. Right. But what it really is is an accelerometer. If I accelerate forward, it goes this way. If I accelerate up, it sloshes this way. If I move my head back, it sloshes this way. Right, right. And so it takes about three days before your brain converts to, from having a gravity detector to having an accelerometer. I see. But the, but the problem comes that when you come back to the ground, <laughs> you now have an accelerometer in your head. And so when I get back to the ground, you would close your eyes to go to sleep at night the fluid would slosh to the back of your inner ear and you would feel like you're accelerating over and over and right. over. So it would give you like the drunken bed spins be just from the new detectors you had in your head. So it, it may be a sense of jet lag, but more be more a sense like a space hangover. <laughs> space hangover. That's, that's a really good one. A three-day space hangover. <laughs> okay. Uh, Richard, for other people who may have the same aspirations, uh, can you tell us what the ticket price of going to space is today? Yeah, so the good, good news, bad news is, <laughs> uh, uh, is that to go suborbital, straight up and straight down with six minutes in space, that will be available starting next year, the relatively modest ticket price is going to start at about $200,000, but will eventually, as time goes on, I believe it'll get under $100,000, maybe as low as $50,000. Okay. Which, so... So in my mind, if you if you can afford to buy one round the world first class ticket in your lifetime, which you probably can, most people can save up that if they decided that's their most important thing in life, then you'll be able to go into space at least one time in your life. On the other hand, if you want to go to orbit until we get space elevators, which we just discussed aren't happening anytime soon, and therefore you have to use a chemical rocket or some other energy to push you there, the energy cost of putting a human in space is somewhere near three or four hundred thousand dollars and so it'll be somewhere in the neighborhood of a million dollars to send anybody to space for the foreseeable future even as the price is starting to come down right uh, and that's more money than most people have in their pockets or would want to you know, spend on a vacation right. however the good news but the good news is is that space is a really valuable place to go the physical properties of space are unique enough to where there's business and work to do in space that's worth more than a thousand dollars, more than a million dollars per person, and so I actually am very bullish on the while it will still only be for a vacation destination for the very wealthy, it's going to become a working destination for tons of people, and as, and if you're an entrepreneur that can think of great vaccine development or you know protein studies or asteroid mining or uh, a lot of other of these new kinds of businesses that are people are now starting to ramp up on for space. I believe space is a profitable place you can go live and work. Office in space. You got it. That's amazing. And your own personal uh, trip where you spent two weeks in the station and the other six people, um, what is the price for basically the deluxe package? Yeah, so if you want to go today, so the, uh, you know, today it's still, you know, it's, it's not cheap, shall we say. Uh, the price today is about $50 million. 50 and million. that is to do basically what I did, which is uh, to train for six months or more, you know, about, about six months nowadays uh, in Russia to prepare for the flight and to fly uh, on the Russian Soyuz and then spend uh, two weeks 
uh, or so approximately on the International Space Station. Interestingly, we also, this uh, I'm one of the owners of Space Adventures, the company that arranges this, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and we actually have another very interesting offering, which is we now have arranged with the Russian government to, they're building us a specially modified Soyuz to go around the moon and back. Oh. And so we are now have a circumlunar flight, uh, which can be yours for the mere price of about a hundred and fifty million dollars. <laughs> and even though that sounds like you know that it's things are getting worse than better, um, uh, interestingly, we already have one customer signed up for that. Uh, this Soyuz will have uh, one R Russian commander and then two uh, of our clients on board. Uh, so we need to find one more. A uh, person who is interested enough in going to the moon that they're willing to put up 150 million dollars or so, right? And uh, and then we'll fly a mission to the moon and back. And uh, there's really good odds that the the next visitors to the moon will not only not be NASA astronauts, they also won't be Chinese astronauts or any other government's astronauts. They might be private. Private. Can you tell us um, if someone is interested in signing up for that ticket, where would they go? Uh, so the, my company that is still today the only uh, company that has sent and can still send uh, people to go live and work in space is called Space Adventures. And so if you just do spaceadventures.com, you can find out more and sign up. All right, guys, and the link to that will be in the description below this video as well. All right, Richard, before we end this final part of our three-part interview series, is there anything you would like to share about space, about yourself, or about any of the other two parts before we end? Well, you know, I think that if there's one thing I've learned through my kind of dual careers in computer games and in space, it is, uh, you know, I, I think there's there's a reason, uh, you know, method. You know, I, there's there's lots of people. There's tons of books you can read about how to succeed in business and do well in life, you know, so to speak. And I think, uh, you know, there's there's many many paths uh, by which this might work. But I but I at least think I can describe uh, what it is for me, um, which is I'm a a big believer on on first. Uh, the subject of research. I'm a devout believer of if you're going to step in any, if you're going to make a computer game or if you're going to invent a space company or whatever it is, you really better know the lay of the land as good or better than anybody else who's competing for that same right. piece of the pie. Uh, and, and strangely, for example, in the computer game industry, I, I see lots of developers who, who just don't do that. They just go off and they say, oh, I like this game. I'm going to fix the thing I didn't like about it and I'll make my own version and I'll make a million dollars. And uh, that, that rarely uh, is a, a path to true success. Uh, but then the other kind of corollary, another piece of that is, uh, you know, ne never uh, take no for an answer. Uh, you know, uh, the, the the old adage of, you know, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Uh, I'm a believer in and the, with the following uh, descriptor. You know, uh, when I first set off to to break into civilian space flight, you know, I, I started by backing ex-NASA astronauts. As astronauts would leave NASA and they want to do something privately, I'm going like, these guys know the industry, they're really super smart, I should back them. Um, but universally, those didn't work. And, uh, and I think in hindsight, it's because uh, those guys are great test pilots, are great scientists, but they're not great... Uh, politicians in the sense of convincing the government they should do something different than they already are, and they're not necessarily great entrepreneurs to go build a, an entrepreneurial endeavor. Right. Uh, but because I because I believe I knew, I could figure out why strategy one did not work, that allowed me to move to strategy two, and therefore not give up and try it again. And if that one fails, as long as you know why it failed, and think you can make it even further down the line with strategy three, no reason not to keep going. And, and, uh, and that's why, even though it took 30 years, uh, ultimately, we've cracked open civilian space flight. Even NASA is now com converting to civilian and commercial support of their endeavors in, of human space flight. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've we've helped really. Not only have I succeeded in taking myself to space, but uh, the group of us that did this have truly not only revolution, revolutionized civilian space flight in general, but commercial space flight in general, also in general, and even NASA's future uh, as well has come along uh, for the ride. So NASA itself is becoming more of a support for the private sector, providing the technology they've researched and basically becoming consultants. Uh, it's close, I even know, but I would describe it from the other direction, which oh. is that NASA has already done the what I'll call the hard lifting. They've, uh, you know, uh, some time ago actually, you know, if you look back at the Apollo era, um, the materials to hold cryogenic fuels didn't exist. NASA invented them, but now they're in everyone's air conditioner. The same thing's true for cryogenic pumps and valves 
didn't used to exist, but now they're again still in your air conditioner. Right. Uh, you know, uh, all these materials and technologies are now reasonably well understood. And so, you know, when you think of like the the Martian rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, and the new one that's about to land, uh, Curiosity, mm-hmm. everyone thinks of those as a NASA mission because they are. But most people aren't aware that they were not launched on a NASA rocket. Those were mm-hmm. launched on a commercial booster. Uh, and uh, and while if you think about the space shuttle, the space shuttle wasn't built by NASA. It was built by Boeing. But NASA owned it. I and see. what the, and by owning it after Boeing built it, it means that they really kind of stuck with it. They couldn't really change to another vehicle if that one proved to be not what they needed in the future or not safe enough or not cost effective enough because now they owned it and they were just getting parts from Boeing. Right. Well, what NASA is moving to is they're now going to use just the way they send spirit and opportunity and curiosity. They're going to buy launch services, a launch at a time for their humans. So SpaceX, mm. which is one of the ones that, I, that, that right now just said they launched uh, Monday, I think, uh, you know, yesterday or the day before. Uh, they're headed to the space station for the first uh, private uh, vehicle to go dock with the International Space Station. Uh, and if they do that for a few times, that NASA will start putting their uh, astronauts on on a private rocket. Well, it, so you know, just like Boeing could have just easily built it as SpaceX, it's just one of the prime contractors. But NASA is not going to own it anymore. They're going to just buy the service. I and that see. means so, – so if ever they want something more like the shuttle, they can buy one. There's a company called Sierra Nevada that's building a lifting body vehicle that they can also buy when they need it. And it also means my company, Space Adventures, can also buy from SpaceX or can also buy from Sierra Nevada, whereas we could never buy from NASA the shuttle because NASA is not in the business of selling to other people. Right. And so this is a win-win situation for commercial and for NASA – NASA's costs are going to go down. Commercial will now have access to the same vehicles. Uh, it'll be much more competitive and much more open uh, for, for everybody. Wow. So the privatization of space becomes an uh, entrepreneur's dream to create services, like you mentioned, so that they could offer a, a, better, a better deal on, 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 on the components necessary to travel to space. Fantastic. You got it. Wow. Well. Friends and viewers, thank you for joining us. This has been George with Richard Garriott, and we'll see you in future interviews. To get the written uh, version of this, go check out stratix.com. They will be featured on that website. And visit our channel on YouTube, youtube.com slash TGN. The links to both are in the description below. Richard, you've been a wonderful guest. Thank you so much. Thanks, George. Pleasure to be here. (laughs) Take care, guys. Zaijian. And we're out. This video is part of the Way Movement, a career path in video sponsored by TGN. To learn more, visit TGN.tv.